we approach a new book, and it's called Mirrors and Mazes, A Guide Through the Climate Change Debate. And the author is Dr. Howard Brady. Uh, there's a website, by the way, with all the details, which is mirrorsandmazes.com.au. I thought we'd find out a bit more, and Dr. Howard Brady is on the line. Dr. Brady, thank you very much for your time. Hi, good morning, Chris. Yes, it was fun writing that book. It took five years. Uh, but the idea was to give people a very simple framework um, where each chapter was a unit in its own right so they could check, say, sea level or model because... Climate science has been on steroids for years, as we all know. Mm. Tell us firstly a bit about yourself and what qualifies you to write about this issue. Uh, Chris, I was an Antarctic science for a, a scientist for a decade. Uh, and in 2011, Northern Illinois University in the United States gave me their Alumnus Scientist of the Year Award for mm -hmm. my contributions to climate. Right. Uh, so uh, I've got a master's a degree and a PhD in Antarctic environmental science and Antarctic history, so I'm more than qualified uh, to talk about it. There's no such thing as a climate science scientist. There's so many different disciplines, but I'm really an historical geologist, and I think that's a very good way of approaching climate. Okay. I suppose the $64 million question is, why is the climate changing, and what's causing it to change, and how much is it changing? Well, first of all, the climate always changes, and... Uh, uh, it was much warmer 8,000 years ago, for example. The rainforests were as far south as Maria, that now at Byron Bay. Um, so that the climate is always changing, and all the reasons for that are complex. Uh, there's the sun, there's the galaxies for, uh, that can affect our cloud formation. There's things on Earth that can also do it. But it's not catastrophic at all, and the whole of the climate models have been on steroids. We know that because... Uh, we were told that Perth would be a wasteland by now. Hanson told us that New York would be flooded by 2010. Uh, it's just over-exaggerated. Uh, the climate's been made too sensitive to CO2 when water vapour is the main greenhouse gas. Uh, it's a mess. CO2, is it the danger that these climate change alarmists say it is? Absolutely not. In 1979, the American Academy of Science sent what they called a climate sensitivity index, which was CO2, water vapour and clouds. Water vapour and clouds triple the effect of CO2 in that index, and that's been the problem, and they've got that wrong. If clouds are wrong, everything's wrong. CO2 is only one thing in the, in the, in the whole situation. All right, let, let's look at man. I was looking at the website of the Worldwide Fund for Nature. It says, what we now know is activities such as burning fossil fuels like coal, oil and gas, and cutting down forests is polluting our atmosphere and warming our planet, causing an increase in extreme weather events, sea level rise, and a warming and acidification of the oceans. Our precious wildlife and ecosystems can't adapt fast enough. What do you make of that view? What a mess. For example, the models are telling us, now this is the problem, all these computer freaks, the models are telling us the storms are getting worse. In this book... Uh, we spend a whole chapter on that and look at graphs. In America, uh, the hurricanes hit it. They have not increased in 150 years. Mm. Uh, tornadoes, the worst year was 1974. Uh, in Australia, uh, the cyclones hitting us in Queensland, they've probably got a little bit less over the last 40 years. The idea that storms are getting worse is rubbish. There's more people around, so there's more damage. They're not worse. Uh, the models are predicting everything wrong. They're overcooked. They're, as I said, they're on steroids. And the idea that things are getting worse, agriculture is getting better. And the IPC tell us that uh, it's not. Uh, uh, no, uh, I, I'm afraid that we're being led down the garden path, and that's why I called the book Mirrors and Mazes. We've got all these distorted mirrors, and we're being stranded as in an English maze. The world... Meteorological Organisation says last year was the Earth's warmest since records began. Firstly, is that right? And has that got anything to do with climate change? It has. And uh, what, what do they mean since records began? Uh, we've only been using thermometers in a really disciplined way for 150 years. <laughs> uh, so, big deal. <laughs> I mean, we know that the medieval warm period was as warm as today. The Roman one was warmer still. The English had vineyards on the Scottish border. Yeah. You know, so that uh, what do you mean when you say 
the warmest since the records began. The last 150 years, gosh, that's only a drop in the ocean in terms of human beings and time. Mm. You write in your book about wheels within wheels, about the sort of environment cycles we experience. You talk about ice ages. But is it possible that what we're experiencing now is just a cyclical event? Absolutely. And and with all this exaggeration, for example... uh, the NASA Goddard Space Center reported on Antarctica last year that the extra snowfall from a little bit of warming is more than compensating for the ice loss and Antarctica is in balance. Can you repeat that again? That is so important. What the, the NASA Goddard Space Center reported last year that because of a little bit of extra warming, the Antarctic ice sheet is getting some more snowfall and that is balancing any loss from icebergs. So mm. Antarctica is in balance and they don't inspect any in, uh, increase in sea level from Antarctica this century. You argue that modern day temperatures are well within the temperature bands of warming periods from the last 4,000 years and can't be described as unprecedented, but boy, oh boy, the media love to talk about unprecedented weather this month, don't they? Oh, they really love it. And did you know in 1886, the New South Wales government arranged trains to get people out of bed because they were dying in a heat wave that's worse than anything we've ever had? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, the whole thing is a mess, I'm afraid. You know, we talk about bushfires, and a lot of the alarmists point to the fact that we've had these terrible bushfires and more people die in bushfires. The, the major change to bushfires has been that many more humans live in bushfire-prone areas than ever before. Oh, absolutely, yeah. That's in the book on weather, which is a whole chapter. And the same applies to floods. You talk about people in Brisbane. Oh, they're more affected by floods now because there are more people in the flood zone. That's right. You know, uh, Florida... Uh, in 1960 had 5 million people. Now there's 25 million. Mm. So if there's a hurricane, or whatever we call it, there's going to be more damage. Mm. Just You're totally right, Chris. There's more people, more infrastructure, more damage. That's all. Mm. I, I, I get a feeling, and I get rather concerned about how teachers have been sold a pup on this as well, and they've fallen for the exaggeration and the alarmist... Um, Oh, principles, and they're passing that on to kids who emerge from school with one thought about climate change. Yeah, all the arguments are too simplistic. I do that in the last chapter of the book. Um, I had an argument and a debate in the New South Wales Legislative Assembly on a global parliamentarian day a couple of years ago with a Professor Harmer from New South Wales, and all he was saying, well, CO2 is going up, temperatures going up. How simple is that? How what an oversimplification. And that's been the trouble in the whole thing. And teachers don't have the uh, background, really, to handle those simple arguments. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the book, because we wanted something that was short, not too long, and was easy to read for everyone, not just scientists. And that was the whole idea of the book. And in terms of some of this rubbish propaganda, I was just looking at some of the television stations this morning, and they've all done it, in response to the story about Donald Trump signing off from the Paris Climate Change Treaty. They show f- film vision, you know, file vision, and they show some of the biggest factories in Australia with pollutants pouring out of the chimneys. CO2 is clear, and it's not officially regarded as a pollutant, is it? Well, it's not a pollutant at all. Our life depends on CO2. As a matter of fact, it went up a little bit. Uh, it wouldn't really hurt us at all. It will help to compensate for the rise in the population of the world. And is it true that it's better that we're warming than cooling? Absolutely. And the scary thing is the Russians have got an experiment on the International Space Station. They are worried, looking at their sunspot uh, data, that the world could cool in a 20 years' time, and that will affect the wheat belt in uh, Belarus and Ukraine. And that's from the uh, Russian Academy of Science, and they've been predicting that since the mid-'90s. And... Uh, They've been very, very good scientists, the Russians, on this, uh, in this particular area. There's a classic underestimation on what the sun and sunspots do to the climate on Earth. Well, the whole relationship we don't properly understand, but we know that in the 1650s, for example, there was no sunspots and we had the coldest uh, climate in the last 300 years. We know also the last three sunspot cycles, uh, the numbers have been dropping. And that's why the Russians say, look out, we're not just dependent on CO2, there's other things happening. Yeah. And in the book on the chapter on the sun, what I say, the sun is like an illusionist on a stage in Las Vegas. I can trick you in many ways and you don't know just how I'm going to do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very, very true. 
fascinating reading, great book, Mirrors and Mazes, A Guide Through the Climate Change yes, Debate. And, Dr. And Dr. Howard Brady, I've run out of time, but Chris. I can refer people to your website, mirrorsandmazes.com.au. That's correct. Thank you very much, Chris, and uh, it's great to talk to you. We'll speak again, no doubt. Thank you for your time.